Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Jackson Hall, and uh, today I'm going to present on the uh, magneto optical Kerr effect. So, uh, first, a brief definition the, uh, the magneto optical Kerr effect, or abbreviated MOC, is a change in the light polarization and/or intensity from a reflection from a magnetic surface. So, this presentation, first, I'm going to give a little background on light polarization and reflection. Then, I'll uh, talk about a, a description of how the effect works. And then finally, I'll examine three common cases of the effect, which are known as longitudinal, transverse, and polar moke. Uh, okay, so here's a little review of uh, light polarizations. For each of these examples, we'll consider the electric field in a fixed plane perpendicular to the propagation direction. As you recall, light consists of uh, electric and magnetic fields that are perpendicular to the propagation. For linearly polarized light, such as in this figure on the top right, the electric field in the fixed plane traces out a line over time. And uh, there's two special cases of this linear polarization, which are shown in the second figure. There's p-polarized light, where the electric field is contained in what's known as the incident plane, where this incident plane is formed by the incident, incident and reflected light beams. And uh, secondly, there's s-polarized light, where that electric field is perpendicular to the incident plane. And uh, also there's elliptically polarized light where the electric field traces out an ellipse over time. A special case of this being circular polarized light, which is shown on the bottom right. And uh, this can be written as a sum of out of phase P and S linear components. So that's part of the motivation of examining these P and S polarizations is a lot of different uh, light polarizations can be broken down into a sum of P and S polarized components. First of all, consider a bit simpler case where uh, we're reflecting off of a non-magnetic material. And uh, by solving for the reflected wave using boundary conditions from Maxwell's equations, the, the key result is that S or P polarized light retains its polarization upon reflection from the metal, although taking on some phase shift probably. And uh, so in general, then, the reflection of linearly polarized light, aside from those two special S and P polarizations, will be elliptically polarized because it consists of S and P components, which are reflected out of phase with one another. So that creates the elliptical polarization. And uh, also, it helps to look at a more microscopic picture of uh, what happens to the electrons in the metal as the light's reflected. So the electric field of the incident wave, which is oscillating back and forth perpendicular to the propagation direction, induces oscillations of electrons in the metal. And uh, it's a superposition of radiation from each electron in the metal that produces the reflected wave. And to further visualize this, it helps to think about the radiation from a single accelerating charge as shown in the picture on the bottom right, where uh, the, the charge has an acceleration Q and then measuring the radiation at this observation point P. And uh, the key takeaway from this is that the electric field radiated is uh, proportional to the perpendicular acceleration component uh, relative to the propagation direction. So for example, in that picture on the top, the uh, reflected electric field is uh, proportional to the perpendicular component of the acceleration of those oscillating electrons in the metal, or at least I mean proportional to that component. So uh, now we'll turn to reflection from a magnetic material, which is where the Kerr effect occurs. And uh, again, the electric field of the incident wave induces oscillations of electrons in the metal. And I'll call this just the normal component of the oscillation. And uh, but now, the material magnetization produces a Lorentz force on the oscillating electrons, which is in a direction of uh, V cross M, the magnetization. And this creates a second, an oscillation in a second perpendicular direction, which I'll call the Kerr component. And the superposition of the radiation from the normal and Kerr components produces a reflected wave with a change in polarization and or intensity. So there's uh, three special cases which are kind of customarily examined for MOC. There's this longitudinal, transverse, and polar, which basically depend upon the orientation of the magnetic field in the sample. And I'll look at each of these in detail next. So the first case is 
longitudinal MOC. And uh, this occurs when the magnetization is in the plane of the sample and parallel to the incident plane, which again, recall the incident plane is formed by the uh, incident and reflected light beams. So uh, in this case, it results in an elliptically polarized reflection. And uh, looking a bit closer at why, we'll examine uh, both the uh, P and S polarized incident light waves separately. Looking at a P polarized incident wave on the uh, lower left, It'll, the electric field of the incoming wave will induce an oscillation of electrons in, in that n direction shown in the diagram. And then taking the cross product of n and m gives the electron oscillation in that direction labeled k, the per oscillation. So then both the, uh, well, the n oscillating component radiates that uh, p polarized wave in the reflection, whereas the uh, per oscillating component it's actually an S polarized component of the reflection. But these two components are out of phase with one another. So the sum of the out of phase PNS components gives an elliptically polarized reflection. And a similar sort of idea happens with the S polarized incident light, which is shown on the right. And I, you can reason through that yourself, I guess. But uh, so the key takeaway, if you look at this uh, diagram on the top right, is the, uh, yeah, the linearly polarized incident wave becomes elliptically polarized and uh, where the electric field traces out this ellipse over time. And uh, the major axis of the ellipse is rotated from the original polarization by an angle which is proportional to the magnetization. So measuring this angle change of the polarization is key to determining what the magnetization of the material is. The second case is known as transverse smoke, where the magnetization is in the plane of the sample and perpendicular to the incident plane. This time there's no change in polarization upon reflection, although there may be an intensity change. So again, first examining the case of P linearly polarized light, uh, it, again, it induces the oscillation of electrons along the direction N. And then taking the cross product of N and M gives the uh, Kerr oscillation of electrons that's this time happens to be parallel to the direction of the incoming light. So now both the uh, normal and Kerr oscillations produce P polarized components in the reflection. So the sum of these two P polarized components is still P polarized light, although the reflected intensity can change depending on how strong the magnetic field is and thus how much that extra Kerr component contributes. For the case of S linearly polarized incident light on the right, the, uh, the oscillations in the material are in the direction N. And then uh, now N and M in the material are parallel. So the cross product is zero. So therefore there's no additional Kerr component of the oscillation and the uh, polarization of the reflected light is unchanged. Finally, the third case is polar moak, where the magnetization is perpendicular to the plane of the sample and parallel to the incident plane. And uh, this creates sort of a similar effect to uh, the first case, longitudinal moak, where the uh, incident wave, which is linearly polarized, gets reflected into an elliptically polarized wave with the major axis rotated by an angle. And that rotation angle is proportional to the magnetization of the sample. So I won't walk through the derivation again, but it's kind of a similar idea to the first case. So in summary, by uh, measuring the moke induced changes in polarization and intensity of the reflected light, we can determine the magnetization of the material. And this forms the basis of a commonly used measurement technique to characterize magnetic materials and uh, image the magnetic domains in the material. And this table provides a, a nice uh, summary of the three different cases that I discussed. Again, uh, the, uh, for the polar and longitudinal cases, the linearly incident light is reflected into an elliptically polarized light with the major axis rotated. And uh, for the transverse case, there's no change in polarization, but rather a change in intensity. And uh, measuring the rotation of the major axis in the polar and longitudinal cases or the change in intensity in the transverse case can be used to determine the magnetization of the material. 
So that's all that I had. Are there any questions? Great. Um, that was on time. Any questions for Jackson? Um, I have a question. So um, can you go back to the, uh, the last slide? So, oh yeah, so in the transfer case, um, how do you take into account uh, sort of like other things that also affect intensity, like the, you know, like the surface roughness or, or stuff like that? Yeah, well, you're right. There are, uh, I'm not sure about the surface roughness specifically, but yeah, there's other uh, considerations such as like the index of refraction of the two materials and also the angle of incidence of the, uh, incoming light has an effect too. So I didn't put them here, but some people have actually described or derived equations that uh, show the intensity is a, of the reflected light as a function of all these different variables. And uh, I, yeah, it, it is a, a problem, I guess. I'm, I'm not totally sure how they account for all that in the, the actual microscope aside from those equations. I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that, but. Yeah, you definitely do have to consider that. And like you mentioned, reflection off of different surfaces and Snell's law and all those things also are important. So usually we do post-processing post to try to account for those things. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, so I know you can do both. You can do milk with both laser light and white light. So did you read anything about the difference between using just a white light source versus the laser source and, and the dependence on the wavelength, if there, if there is any? Uh, the hard question, it's okay if you don't. I, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess I would, I would imagine that there's a, a little wavelength dependence in the reflection too. So probably a laser source would be better, but I don't know, is that what you're going for? Well, I, I was just more curious with what you read about it because you can't yeah, get both. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't really read much about that. So sorry. <laughs> I don't know. And then a, a related question is um, you're describing uni domain, but if you had an in plane magnet, but in multiple angles in plane, yeah. it would pick up different signals. Well, I, I mean, Again, I imagine you could you could uh, sweep the the uh, laser or whatever across the surface, and depending on where it reflected in the material, then it would uh, image where the magnetization goes at that particular spot. Yeah. So, kind of what I'm getting at is that, um, like in your in this picture here, the green magnets are all uni domain. Yeah. So if it like if the middle one like M was in the plane, but then different angles in the plane, it would still get using longitudinal milk, you still pick up different signals, right? Yes, I, I believe so. Hmm. 